When Kyle and I were young, our mother in particular didn't want us riding motorized vehicles. I mean, like no mini bikes or three wheelers, <laughs> no, yeah. anything like that. Go karts. <laughs> yeah, nothing. And um, of course we did, you know, like over friends' houses and that kind of stuff. And uh, would get hurt occasionally and then not tell my mother how I think I broke my ankle, <laughs> that kind of stuff. They were very, very um, energized when they were young. They did not sit around, which they still don't. <laughs> Uh, anyway, fast forward, and um, I know I was 18. I didn't know anything about motorcycles. I didn't know anything about mechanics. I was really into computers and graphic design. And for some reason, I just really liked the look of vintage Triumph motorcycles. And I ended up buying a 1970 Triumph with a 1978 750cc five-speed motor in it uh, that was an old flat track race bike. And uh, I think you went to picked that up with me, didn't you? When I, bought I think that? so, yeah. Yeah, I, long, I don't even remember where I bought it, somewhere in Ohio, really cool bike and uh, I learned to ride. I lived in Parma, Ohio at the time, and I literally learned to ride by bump starting it down the driveway right onto State Road into traffic, having no idea really what I was doing and uh, riding it around, you know, and just figuring it out, basically. And uh, that's how I got into motorcycles. I started Lowbrow in early 2004. I worked full time in addition to Lowbrow for the first five years as a graphic designer and a sign maker and until Lowbrow gradually became more and more of my day and I decided to go for it essentially. So I would do graphic design and a little bit of website design, HTML programming and doing um, lettering work vans and banners and basically anything with lettering on it. And I was self-employed, I just did that out of my house. But I had that bike and I was working on it. Uh, I didn't know how to hardly turn a wrench when I bought it. I was trying to find parts and information back in 04, you know, it's hard to remember now, but there, it's not like there was a bunch of places to buy motorcycle parts. Uh, at all uh, on online, not many, especially not for vintage motorcycles and not for choppers. Such an early time in the internet age, people forget right. you couldn't go out on a thousand forums and, and look at all this stuff. That exposure right. was a lot more right. uh, limited than it is now. Right. Yeah, I had, um, I was, you know, trying to find parts for these old Triumphs. I didn't know anyone locally. I was just learning how to do anything mechanical. So like say ordering parts was hard, finding the parts, and then would they ever show up? Are they gonna be what I need? And it was really a painful experience, kind of. Painful meaning just a total pain in the ass. Uh, and I thought, you know, shoot, I could do better than this. And uh, that's basically how Lowbrow started. Um, the name I just made up and I thought it sounded good, I guess, I don't even remember. I thought it was a good name and I still do. And uh, bought the domain name and designed the logo. This was probably in 03 and I proceeded to do nothing with it for a solid year or something. And then one day I just kind of got my butt in gear and said, all right, I'm gonna make a website and start, uh, uh, you know, trying to make this happen. So I started with using my sign making equipment and abilities, doing stickers, printing t-shirts, carrying Dice Magazine around issue four or something, just starting to get in like hard to find an underground media. You know, that was when no one knew any of these things, basically it was kind of hard to, hard to find. You couldn't even find it in the United States mostly. And going to a lot of little hot rod shows, there weren't, weren't really many motorcycle shows around that uh, weren't kind of your run of the mill, like poker runs and things like that. So anyway, sl slowly like I'd go and set up at a show with a four foot card table with like a few t-shirts and a few magazines. And I'd sit there and talk to people and, you know, sell a few things. And uh, at the time I was driving a 65 Ford Econoline that I'd painted with a roller, Rust-Oleum flat black. Uh, you know, I had holes through the floor and it was a total junker a lot of time, a lot of effort going to tons of shows, um, you know, and just kind of earning customers one at a time, getting people to know who we were, trying to get people to the website and that kind of stuff. And Lowbrow started growing uh, and I moved from the bedroom upstairs to the basement and then was using the bedroom and the basement. He was helping me build a website for myself. And I remember going to his old house and he had just boxes stacked up everywhere. I'm like, what is all that? He's like, oh, that's just like lowbrow stuff. Those are orders I have to ship out. I'm like, wow, people really are buying this. That went on for a couple of years and I was really running out of room and ended up moving to the country, to Hinkley, Ohio, where I ended up with a house that I bought at auction, cheap with a flooded basement and no kitchen. The house was gutted and all this. And, uh, but it had a, it was an 800 and some square foot house and a 2,000 square foot garage. So I bought that 
house because of the garage. That's like all I cared about. That was a new home of uh, a step above signs, my old sign company and lowbrow customs for the following, you know, five years or so, you know, still just myself. Uh, you know, doing everything, you know, posting things on forums, getting, you know, working on bikes myself, uh, riding bikes, doing things like uh, little events like going on the, the first gypsy runs that uh, Walter was putting on out on the East Coast, uh, any, any, basically any events we could find. At that point, we weren't putting on, or I wasn't putting on any of our own events yet. You know, we started carrying more parts, uh, having some small different parts made. And I would design some real basic parts and have them made by local machine shops and things. And we started uh, carrying Biltwell helmets and handlebars and things when it was, you know, their first or second year in business and um, selling those, which were getting really popular. Um, not nearly as popular as they are now, but uh, it was kind of the budding vintage style chopper movement. So around 2009 maybe 2008 my brother kyle moved back from i think san diego maybe at that time uh west coast somewhere so he moved back and i was getting too busy to do the sign company and lowbrow and i liked doing lowbrow so much more and i had that feeling like this is the time to really just like go for it so what am i gonna what's my, what's the path you know what's the point of, of this what do i want to do with it and i remember telling kyle like hey i think we could do something with lowbrow, I think this could be something, but uh, I can't really pay you much money because I didn't have very much money. So I said, uh, I think I'd offer what, $8 an hour? I think so. And yeah. I said, work with me for a year. <clears throat> and if it works out, and I think it will, it's gonna be great. But if it doesn't, it's like no harm, no foul, <clears throat> whatever. We tried and we, you know, that is what it, it is. And it was actually a combination. It was lowbrow and sign yeah, company. And sign company. It, it was right. kind of like whatever needed to be done. Right, whatever filled the days. And when Kyle came on board, uh, you know, we really work well together. I'm great with ideas. He's very good with execution and organization. And so uh, he was my first employee there behind the house in Hinkley. And uh, that year things really just started kind of ex exploding growth wise, really just uh, started carrying a lot more parts, getting a lot more customers, selling a lot more products. People started, uh, I guess, knowing about us, you know, finding the website. People started showing up at my, my house, I think thinking it was gonna be a, a store and uh, we also hired Katie, uh, who's, who's still here, uh, while we were there behind the house. Once I had a daughter, uh, my first daughter, it was, realized it was time to move because we didn't have a bathroom in the shop at the time. And so I would tell Kyle, like, no, you're not going in the house, the baby's sleeping, and he'd have to drive to the gas station to use the bathroom. And, uh, you know, things like that, you know, we'd go like, and then I remember when one day we had a couple show up from Tokyo at, at the garage door. Uh, they just were like in town, I think, and drove from like Chicago, which is six or seven hours away uh, without calling ahead or anything. And then that same day, two guys showed up from Spain and I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. We need to move out of my backyard. He's like, oh, I'm closing down the sign business. Lowbrow is actually doing good. And we were all kind of blown away. I know I was. That's when I started looking around and ended up buying a big chunk of industrial land in Medina, Ohio, 22 acres with a really crappy old warehouse on it, set way back and you, that you couldn't see from the road. Got a heck of a deal on it. It had been empty for a number of years. Uh, the industrial land was pretty much like kind of brambly woods. And Tyler being the awesome boss that he is, we had dirt bikes. He actually hired a guy to come in there and run through the woods with a, with a bobcat to make some dirt bike trails and just randomly and during the middle of the day when we're supposed to be working we'd get a dirt bike and go for a ride out in the field he goes it makes the workers happy when they can do something fun and then get back to work and so it was very private it had like a tenth mile long gravel driveway with big ankle brake size uh chunks of gravel it's about the worst the worst motorcycle company driveway in right. the world yeah it was like that's where <laughs> it tested people's talent you know because a lot of people wiped out in that driveway just going slow and if you don't know how to ride in loose huge gravel but yeah so we we're in this uh this warehouse old truck service warehouse it was great it was eleven thousand square feet so going from our old shop to that one we were, you know, skateboarding inside and freaking riding motorcycles and yeah, dirt bikes through it. We had it. so much room for a tiny bit of time. And so, you know, we kept, kept growing. We started hiring more people. Todd Muller, our head uh, motorcycle tech, who's one of my good friends. And uh, I've known him for years via Vintage Triumphs. Kept asking, he said he wanted to work at Lowbrow for a number of years. And I just told him like, man, I can't, I can't even afford another employee. Uh, at some point we'll get there. And when we moved to Medina, it was right at the same time as when I hired Todd. 
Well, basically in the early days of lowbrow, it was just Tyler in his garage behind his house. And I'd call over there and no one ever answered the phone. And so I used to leave silly phone messages saying, I'm calling about the job answering the phones, just goofing around. And so now here I am several years later, answering the phones, talking to customers. He's a real character, super solid guy, and has been working on motorcycles since before I was born. So, I mean, he's full of knowledge and uh, an important, super important part of Lowbrow, our team, our brand, our information that we get out there to our customers and stuff for free. We just started hiring more people at that point. So it went from three to, I don't even know when we left, probably 10 or 11, or 12 employees. I think employees. so because, yeah, I mean, we've, we got, you know, Jim Dove, who's now our warehouse manager, was hired on then. I applied and then immediately got a call back from uh, Greg, gorgeous Greg, everybody knows him. And he's like, hey man, you wanna come over, man? Just come on down, man. And I'm like, what, like when? Like now, man, we're here. And I'm like, okay. Uh, Tony Reichert, who's our, our, basically our head customer service. Right. He was hired. All of a sudden I got a call from the buddy that worked here. Hey, you know, this job opening, this lowbrow customs place, this cool little motorcycle shop. I'm like, yeah, cool, sounds great. And I, I walk in and I see Tyler and Kyle sitting at the desk, just neck down, covered in tats. And I was like, well, that's great. Uh, Troy, who is, uh, does programming. And VP of e-commerce. Yes, yes, yeah, he, he was Long hired here. Otherwise known as Jason, who's our graphic designer. Me and Tyler are high school friends. It was always a joke, like, oh, one day we're gonna work for you. And he didn't really want employees. And so when I lost my job, I'm like, hey man, can I use you a reference? And that was like, no, come in, let's talk. And so we started talking and here I am six years later working at Lowbrow. Kind of surreal if you ask me. So uh, in the three years maybe we were in Medina, it uh, the company grew honestly so quick, like I didn't have, ever have time to think about it because we were basically just jamming all the time. Also always by the seat of our pants. By the time we moved, we had four shipping containers in the parking lot full of stock because the building was too full. So we, we had yeah. six people in an office the size of this room. Uh, all guys, it was horrible. <laughs> I mean, we just hit capacity, like we, we were way past capacity. Yeah, and it would like it would rain and there was like 200 leaks in the roof, like literally. <laughs> we always joke about just how much the building leaked. I mean, every time it rained outside, it rained inside because there were so many screw holes in the roof. Uh, it, it was kind of ridiculous and ongoing for years just trying to just fix all those leaks. It just was not an ideal building. So uh, we ended up, selling that and buying the warehouse we're in now, which, uh, which is in Brunswick. It was a bingo card warehouse. So it was literally full of bingo cards, palletized bingo cards, <laughs> that's it. We ended up borrowing every dollar I could get to buy that building. So we have a really nice showroom that's open to the public Monday through Friday. Customers, you know, who aren't from too far away come by, pick up their, their parts. We pull things from the shelf so they can, you know, they can ride their bike up and we can grab handlebars and they can hold them and sit on their bike and kind of check stuff out in person. We also get people stopping by who are riding or driving cross country who pop in just to check lowbrow out, which is um, which is pretty neat. Hopefully, we will never uh, move again because it was a total pain, and it's <laughs> spent every dollar I could borrow to be here, and uh, and I'm glad I did. I couldn't be happier with our uh, with our setup now. So the way I run my business, and this would go for, I mean, for myself personally, for employees, and also how we how we treat our customers and deal with our customers, it's the same way I lead my life. And it's super easy uh, if you do it. And it's basically, uh, I don't lie, and I don't rip people off. Uh, I'm always trying to do things that are win-win, you know? It's good for me and good for other people, because I find that if you're, you're honest and you're uh, authentic, you're true to yourself, and that's what you you know share with people. Then life's really freaking easy. We look at business from the viewpoint of a customer. Like if I'm the customer, what's the best case scenario? Like you know what's going to freaking wow me and make me stoked to right. do business with this company? And that's how we still operate. We say, well, I want you know, I want like the 
coolest stuff that fits perfect and I'm gonna have all the information I need before I buy and it's gonna ship right away and if I have a question I can call and I can get help with it and uh, you know we just try and do everything that we want as customers and then it makes things really easy because if you're looking out for your customers and not just for your bank account or yourself then and naturally I think business follows you know with the customer service like the power that he gives me to like you know take care of these people you know that you know how if that was you you know how would you feel if this happened I mean he's the owner of the company but he he's one of us kind of thing so he he knows like oh that's a you know that's not a good situation that it happened like this what can we do to make this better let's you know let's try to help this out you know that's how he would want to do it or, or things like that so yeah it's cool you know we have lots of we have like you know vibrant base of customers and enthusiasts and people who support us in more ways than just being a paying customer but meaning you know people who are down for the cause you know we're into what we're into i think a big misconception is you know, people think we're a huge company, but there's only 12 of us, and that's including Tyler and Kyle. Uh, Mikey mentioned that on uh, some forum, some guy posted that we're some big corporation and we're ripping people off, and people just piled on in our support saying, what the heck are you talking about? And I love that because we don't need to worry about refuting, you know, the odd naysayer because uh, there's nothing to refute. I think people are so used to getting screwed, honestly, by businesses that, uh, people get blown away. We get, if we have someone who has a uh, subpar experience or whatever, it's our fault or it's a shipping problem or whatever, we, we, take, care of them. we take care of them. And man, that's something that like, you get someone who's pissed and then they're expecting to get screwed and then you make it right and we lose, you know, we spend whatever, you know, we spend money to make that customer happy, whether it's shipping out a replacement part or overnighting it or whatever. And uh, it changes their attitude because they're so ready to get screwed over that it almost kind of shocks them. And those people often tend to be our biggest um, like ambassadors, enthusiasts. You know, they're the one out there who's then telling everyone how, how we did it. We're stand up and did a good job. The way I look at it, you know, we throw a big camp out like the low brow get down and we're drinking beer and sleeping in the dirt with guys camping out, swimming in the quarry, riding motorcycles. Well, of course they're going to do business with us. Why wouldn't they want to? You know, I mean, we're it's developing those relationships that are real relationships. You know, the camaraderie, you know, having a good time. You know, you have a good time with someone, you trust them. When it's authentic and it's legit, it's super easy. I think people who have trouble uh, in many industries, but even like in motorcycling for sure, because they're posturing, you know. They're trying to manufacture an image. Right, you know, yeah. I'm not a tough guy, you know. Don't fuck with me, but I, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, look like a tough guy. I like to have fun. I ride motorcycles and smile. You know, it's a good time. And I think that's the reality of it for people, you know? So I think um, just being real. I didn't know how to do anything on a motorcycle when I first started riding. You know, everyone starts somewhere and being honest about that stuff, you know, it's just real, it's regular. Where the machismo, the bravado, it's like, yeah, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's like so transparent and absurd and, uh, simply by not doing that <laughs> and just being like being real you know you know if someone's full of shit or if they're uh, authentic and that's kind of it in a nutshell it's like uh if we do what's right and what's right is uh, you know standing behind our products providing cool parts uh designing great new new products you know we don't spend a bunch of money on advertising or things like that but we spend a lot of money on making our, our customers happy you know, it's easy to know what parts to make or what to do or um, how to reach out to people who might be interested in what we do because it's, it's what we're interested in. So it's pretty, I don't know, it's just natural. It's just, uh, we're in the motorcycle business because we love motorcycles. We're not in the motorcycle business just to make money. You know, it's more than that. It's a, um, it's a passion, it's a creative outlet. And I, I don't know, I feel like, I know I love what I do and I love that we built this um, to me, business is like, you know, it's building your own world. So no one would give either one of us this job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just isn't happening. So we had to make the job, right? And so we make the company uh, that we would want to work for and hire the people we want to work with and do business the way we want to do business. And now it's all on our terms. To me, the way all businesses should be run. He wants to make sure that you're having a good work experience. He, he knows that you know, this is a job and you know, one thing is, you know, there's no, there's not really a turnover rate here because when people come here, they, they love working here so much that nobody leaves. It's been really inspirational to see how 
he does things and to see how it trickles down into the whole staff, but then also how it translates into what we do as a business. Like he doesn't see it as a business. It's a, it's a hobby, it's a fun thing. And he treats everyone with respect and equally, and we all have fun together. And to see it as not just a business, but a organiz organization of fun and creating is brilliant to see the stuff that he puts out and drive that he does to create parts, to be innovative and above everyone else in this industry. It's pretty special also to be a part of. You know, I feel proud to come to work every day and help create his vision and my own vision. That's the other thing. He, he always pushes everyone to have their own vision, but as long as it's a united front and in certain aspects, you know, it's, uh, it's really cool to see that he's very supportive in that. He's very down to earth. He's, he treats everyone here at the shop with respect and kindness because of the fact that we were friends before I started working here, which was also, uh, he almost didn't give me a job working here because he said, you know, he goes, Todd, I'd like to give you a job working for me. I think we could use you, but I'm a little concerned because we're friends and I don't want to lose our friendship because the new job doesn't work out for you. He's just a, a really super nice guy that you, there's nothing you can find that you don't like about him. It's the fucking truth. I know it is. You can ask anybody about Tyler he, and he's modest too. He I mean, goes above and beyond for all of us, you know, as employees and I mean, just friends too. And, and that's cool. And you know, your boss is, you know, a friend and, and you feel, you know, comfortable and you can talk to him and, you know, not feel weird like, oh, no, that's the boss, you know. What Tyler does for us is super awesome. I've never had a boss that, you know, goes out of his way and actually notices that you're, you know, working hard and actually appreciating it. It's very family oriented here. And that's what I love most about it. Cause it's like, not only do, you know, I get like a cool new job, like I gained a family. And I think that's like the best thing about it. It's just like working for a family, you know, obviously Tyler and Kyle being brothers, um, we all have our own quirks, we all have our own way of doing things, but it all seems to work. Uh, yep, Tyler is CEO, so that means my brother is the boss. And, uh, you know, most of the time we were on the same page, and you know, but here and there, I mean, we're still brothers. So uh, here and there, that kind of gets pulled into disagreements, and, and it, it can be pretty funny. It's the culture, it's, it's from the up down. So I have to say that I'm just really impressed that I raised such wonderful young men and that they're taking care of their individual families because they each have their own family and that they take care of lowbrow like a family. The majority of the employees that are here have been here from the beginning. We've seen a couple of people come and go that went for other opportunities, but a lot of the people that are here today we're here when the business got its initial start in the first warehouse. I don't want to, for instance, be some old guy with a bunch of money. Uh, that wouldn't make me happy. What makes me happier is saying, hey, I'm going to provide jobs. You know, I'm going to uh, provide people with the opportunity to make good money and have a lot of perks and benefits. You know, so we do everything we can to go beyond like the average. Basically, it's like we want to take care of everyone because these people all around me are my friends and some of them are my family. When the company does well, everyone here does better. And I want, you know, years from now, I want everyone to be really excited that they've been, that we've all been working together and, uh, you know, had that opportunity, you know. Now, I was reading a silly Easy Rider magazine and I saw an advertisement for a Harley Motorcycle School and I said to my wife, I said, gee, I like working on bikes, maybe I should go to this school. And uh, shortly thereafter, I was enrolled in uh, MMI. Uh, I was supposed to go to school in Florida, but my 46 Chevy truck was not going to Florida. It only made it as far as Arizona. And so I basically called the school from a campground in outside of... Uh, someplace in Arizona and said, hey, can I go to school in Arizona? And they said, sure, no problem. Uh, so I graduated Harley School in, I believe it was right around 1990. Uh, went to work at a shop and I was like, 
holy crap, I get to work on bikes all day and I get paid for this? And then I get to go for a ride? This is the best job ever. I love this job. After many years of doing that job, I was getting kind of burned out on working on mo uh, modern Harley. And so I wanted to stay in the motorcycle business and that's why I came to work at Lowbrow. Some of my main hobbies are really just going to concerts and following Metallica around. Uh, I'm at like almost 60 sometimes seeing them so far and I have like 14 more on the books for this upcoming 2019 year. So Lowbrow has been pretty uh, positive as far as giving me the go ahead, go. It's your dream, go do it. And it really is a dream just to go follow them around. So that's my number one hobby, expenditure and all the above. I do murder mysteries, I do stand-up comedy. I haven't done stand-up comedy in a while, but it's really hard. The last time I did a stand-up comedy show, like a legit stand-up comedy show, this is the truth. The night, Friday night, I killed. Did like half an hour, everybody loved it. Guy was like, oh, we want you to come back, to come back tomorrow, you're the opener, like you're the head guy, you're gonna be the main guy, uh, cause the main guy canceled, so you're the main guy. I'm like, great, you know? He's like, you get 75 bucks. I'm like, ah, oh, I need that $75, that's sweet, you know? So I go in, same set I did Friday. I come in, and in the first 10 minutes, zero laughter, and this is all I heard. I heard ice on a glass and someone go. And so I was like, all right, I'm, thanks everybody. I'm like, because if they weren't laughing at the first 10 minutes, they're not gonna, because the first 10 minutes was heavy. It was hitting the night before. So stand-up comedy is tough. And, and I really took a, I got bombed before, but that was probably the hardest I've ever bombed. I did comedy at a laundromat and it went over better than this club, you know? So I haven't done stand-up in a while, but I do that, I'm an entertainer. So I do murder mysteries, stand-up comedy, sketch comedy, anything that entertain, I love doing that. I used to be in bands and used to do art a lot when I was in high school and out of high school. I toured the country with bands when I could. After my mom died, I lost everything, like my ways of like anything artistically and photography just kind of fell into my lap, really. It, um, two, three months on a bender of just drinking nonstop. And my wife's like, you need to get your shit together. And after realizing how much of a shit bag I was, I was like, I need to start creating again. So I started painting and it wasn't really gratifying. And then I saw our camera sitting there, just collecting dust on a shelf. I said, hey, what's this doing here? Can I use this? Well, yeah, go ahead, just don't break it. And I've never looked back since I touched that camera. Just being able to take it to different parties and get that instant gratification of shooting something and going to a motorcycle show or a car show and, and shooting stuff and then coming home and instantly seeing what I looked at in a visual eye and then editing and tweaking and creating something beautiful. It was like night and day for me and it just nonstop from there on out. And then the video aspect of, of my job here, it's kind of funny. I look back now and I'm like, wow, I actually did do a lot of that when growing up. I used to skateboard all the time. I used to have a video camera with me all the time. We used to videotape skateboarding. It's the same thing with motorcycles and parts and doing tech tips and whatever and other things. It's just translated a little differently. And I never put two and two together that, wow, that could be a passion and a life of mine and a thing when I was younger. And I wish I would have found it faster because doing photography and video, that's it's my life now. That's all I do. So we got started uh, in racing in late 2009, early 2010. It was our first <clears throat> year for both of us racing land speed at the Bonneville Salt Flats. It was Bonneville Speed Week 2010. Tyler wanted to do land speed racing in Bonneville where you go three miles flat out, full throttle, and then shut down trying to set a speed record. And uh, I know I got interested because I'd go and hang out with my friend uh, Wes White of Four Aces Cycle in Pacoima, California, and stay sleep on his couch and you know work with him in a shop for a week, you know here and there, uh, learn from him. And uh, he raced at Bonneville for several years, and his enthusiasm was infectious. You know, got me really interested. And I remember one trip in particular I had. Uh, actually, it was the start of this bike, but I was building it as a chopper and I came back from that trip and I thought this is the perfect basis for me to build a race bike. And Kyle and I started talking about going to Bonneville 
which I think, you know, that point was like 10 months away or something. So no problem, build two bikes in 10 yeah, months. Yeah, you know, Easy. knowing nothing, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, getting, getting them all ready, learning the rules, the safety uh, inspection rules, so we could pass tech, make sure the bikes were up to snuff and allowed to race. Uh, and actually a funny story, I was thinking about this the other day, is at that point, 2010, I'd been riding motorcycles for 12 years maybe, and Kyle probably about the same. And to race at Bonneville, you have to have your motorcycle endorsement. I didn't have a motorcycle endorsement. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> I, I. I never even got my temps, honestly. I would get my temps that. once in a while, and it's good for a year, and then it would expire. And, just, and I'd get pulled over once in a while, and the police officers were always cool or never seemed to know or care. I don't know what it was, but I'd never gotten a ticket on a motorcycle. I've been pulled over a number of times. And so I just never bothered getting my motorcycle endorsement. But so to race, you had to. And uh, we actually took the Ohio safety riders course, rider safety course which is like $25 and you go for a weekend. And, and it was fun, I, you know, I learned some things, you know, whatever. It was, you know, messing around on motorcycles for a weekend. But it was just kind of funny going to get a license after more than a decade of riding and having like a full on motorcycle company at that point, you know. Oh, actually I do know why I didn't take the motorcycle riding course because I didn't own a single Oh, legal, legal motor. Yeah, you had to have turn signals and mirrors yeah. and the whole deal. So right, like, so you'd have, like yeah. we did, I don't even... hand shift, raked out, frickin' triumph, you know, or like bikes with no mufflers, no gauges, no turn signals. You can't rent a bike if you don't have a license. Right, so, so all these motorcycles were A, like not the right geometry to be banging out figure eights inside of a parking spot or whatever you do in the test, or they were simply, they just didn't pass the legal requirements. I think that's why I never went and get a license. I just, most of the people I knew were also riding like chopped up bikes at, wouldn't pass the safety inspections to be road legal. We started building race our race bikes. Um, me building this bike and Kyle building. I built a 68 Triumph. Right, and that was in the office of Lowbrow and my sign company, which was the uh, outbuilding uh, behind my house in Hinkley. And I remember, I mean, I would, was sitting at a, a desk where I had my computer and I'd be doing work and Kyle was literally assembling his race bike on the carpet, like on the little space behind my desk. It's the only place I could find six, eight feet. We, we, didn't we only had one motorcycle had, yeah. list, I mean, or yeah. lift rather. Right, this was on a little, in a, on a lift and a little work bay, a little tiny work bay I had next to the office. Uh, Tyler approached me and he said, hey Todd, uh, I want to build a dual engine uh, race bike and use Triumph engines. And I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. He goes, I, I'd like you to help me. And I go, cool, I'll help. Sounds like fun. And then the, the fateful day in the Middle Bay workshop at the Medina warehouse, we had the bike ready to run. And Tyler said to me, how in the heck are we gonna cook these two engines together and make it all work? And I go, well, we had a piece of chain sitting on the workbench because we had welded sprockets. Uh, to each other to attach the two engines together uh, with a 530 chain, single row chain. And I said, oh wait, let me go get a special tool for timing the engines. I went to my desk around the corner against the wall in the, in the parts department and I grabbed a pencil and I cut the end of it off and I shoved it in the spark plug hole. I took all the plugs out of both motors and I put it in the plug hole and I rotated the motor until the piston was all the way at the top, which is top dead center. I went to the second motor and I did the same thing and I put the chain on and I said, all right, fire it up. And everybody was all nervous. They're like, are you sure? Is this going to work? And I'm like, we'll know pretty quickly if it's not right. And uh, had an electric starter motor with a battery to turn the engines over. There's a big nut on the end of the crankshaft. Fired it up, bam, thing ran perfectly. It was a pretty joyous day in the in the lowbrow workshop. Yeah, I don't know. It was a steep learning curve. You know, we went out there and race. I had an absolute blast and came well prepared. But it's a hostile environment. It's high altitude. Uh, the weather can be bad. The salt can be. The salt was actually good those first couple I years. I chased but it electrical gremlins for five days. Right. My first six runs. I couldn't go above fifty miles an hour. This was, the, the bike ignition was, just, was breaking up. Yeah, the bike would just cut out and pop and. And, and you have to do a rookie run there um, just to prove that you can handle the bike, go the full length of the course. And finally, I think like literally like the fifth or sixth run, I just sat up one handed, just pop, 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 pop for, you know, for two miles. 
just to get it over with. Just to get it over <laughs> just, with. Just, just to get it done. We were gone two weeks, drove out in an old RV. Uh, I bought like a mid early 90s, 23 foot little RV. Uh, that way we use that as our chase vehicle. We could be like in line for two hours in the blazing sun in Utah, but like eating bean burritos in the air conditioning with our race leathers on. With one crew member. We We're brought just, our dad. Yeah, yeah, our dad. One crew member for two people, which. In a high stress environment. Uh, um, yeah. Learning curve. It was like, with you know, family on top of it. It was, yeah. it was, it was a fun year. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. It, at the time, I think there was some anger. Maybe a little. <laughs> I, uh, I qualified for a record that year and then bent a valve on the backup run, couldn't back it up. But needless to say that whole, the whole process was like, there's no question like, oh, this is an amazing way to spend some time, you know, and, uh, and effort in the year leading up to it. Uh, so we, even though it's 2,200 miles driving from here to Utah. A lot of people are going out to the salt flats, trying to attain that, getting that speed for that record. And it was pretty amazing that with Tyler's drive and determination, and he just went out there and did it, made it happen. You know, it's, it's amazing to be racing at the same event where it's literally the fastest motorcycles and the fastest cars on the planet are racing currently and have raced. And uh, the ability to just walk in the pits and like, you know, walk up to... Challenger 2. Yeah. And then watch yeah. it go by at 453 miles an hour. And you walk up and talk to these Sanity. guys and check out their car and their friend. They actually... <laughs> that was, they welded up my oil tank. Oh, that was Speed Demon. Oh, the Speed Demon, one of the, you know, the other fastest cars in the world, over 400 miles an hour. And I had a crack in my oil tank uh, due to my old TIG welding, <laughs> just from vibration. But the fact is I've got this little Triumph that's doing 125 miles an hour, I had a crack in my oil tank, and those guys stopped what they're doing to help me out because they had a TIG welder. That's just like the spirit of the sport. So you can have a guy with a crusty pickup truck and his son, and they're racing some, you know, some old Honda or whatever uh, that costs them a few hundred bucks and they're there having as much fun potentially or more than guys that have 30 guys in a mess hall and the world's fastest car. Um, what's nice is it's that whole gamut. It's a real motorsport, but the entry level can be so low depending how you decide to enter it. You know, you, we went out um, not knowing what we were doing and, and had a blast the first year and- um, Year two went back ready to go we both recorded right. multiple times that year. Yeah. Um, we, we set the bar pretty high there, you know, going back second year, some people go back 10 years and never hit that record. Right. Um, so we, we started pretty strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. And the racing uh, came, uh, that was just like pure personal passion and focus, uh, but it does tie into our business in that um, I think people see and respect that you know, we do that for fun. You know, it's again, it comes back to what I was, uh, what I was saying as far as, uh, you know, we are our customers, you know, it's the same, we have the same drive. I believe that same drive and determination is what is allowing Lowbrow Customs to continue to grow as a company and still maintain, you know, a lot of people think we're this giant company, like, uh, j &P Cycles or Dennis Kirk or Revzilla or something, and we're not. The amount of customers that kind of come out and show up on the salt yeah. because they live in the area, uh, the amount of customers that have gone out and built race bikes of their own mm -hmm. because they saw us do it. Right. I mean, See, stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that is like, I mean, like hugely gratifying. That's, it's super cool to like somebody to tell you that you, you inspired them to do something right. when, I mean, you know, we were just chasing something we wanted to do. I could speak to the future of Lowbrow in that I have no freaking idea. You know, it's like, there's never been a game plan. It's never been like, we're going to have this many parts. We're going to make this much money. Or we're going to do anything. Uh, there's no game plan. I assume we'll be doing it for a long time. And anytime we've ever made like a, bu a business plan or a five-year goal, it's just been completely shattered one way or another. I mean, it right. We never know what trajectory we're going to go on. I mean, three years ago, I would never imagine we're in the nice building we're in now. No. What I know personally is that if I'm excited for what we do and I'm happy on a personal level as well as work level and I'm having fun, then I'll just keep doing it. It's like a constant flux and it always has been because we're uneducated. <laughs> we're just like, we don't know what we're doing. You know, we're just, uh, well, I mean, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> <laughs> but just, uh, 
you know, literally flying by the seat of her pants, going like, okay, you know, this seems like a good idea. I, it's a, something I think has been a huge positive in many ways over the years because I can't tell you how many times I've done something and people are like, are you freaking crazy? Yeah. What are you doing? That's never gonna work. And had I listened to them, lowbrow wouldn't exist. So had I had uh, gone to college or had more, I'm not saying it's bad, but for me it was not the right path, uh, but it might have changed the way I did things because the way lowbrow was built is not traditional. It was slow because it was- It was bootstrapped. Yeah, it was bootstrapped with, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any- Yeah, there, were, there was power, no you know. loans. I mean, it was right. just rolling that profit back. It was in. like, cool, I made 20 bucks. I sold some stickers. Cool, 17 of that's gonna go back into the company. Uh, people say like, oh, you know, you guys are lucky. I mean, I guess I can't say there's no luck involved because timing was great, early e-commerce years and, and this and that, but it was just hard work. The motorcycle industry is tough. I know only a handful of people that make a full-time living in the motorcycle industry. My advice, whether it's painting or building bikes or starting a parts company like Lowbrow or whatever, my advice is, uh, yeah, work your, work your ass off, put the time in. Uh, I know all my friends were at the bar going snowboarding or this or that, and I was, coding HTML and editing photos in Photoshop and writing product copy, you know? You have to pay to play, I guess, you know? And obviously you wanna work smart, but the reality is it's hard freaking work, you know? We put in, as a, this is our life's work, literally, you know? Fabrication in general, making things, working, uh, learning, like I'm a definite professional amateur, you know, I build, uh, build bikes for fun, you know, not for anyone else, but, um, I typically work on race bikes like this one, or I'm building a new one right now. Uh, and what I enjoy is learning new skills and kind of pushing that. So he's pu pushing always to like better yourself and he never shies away like, hey man, this project might take me two weeks. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, take the time, learn it, go at it, do it. You know, he's always supportive. He's not like, no, I really need this done now. He's not one of those guys that's just like a hard ass and trying to push you in a wrong way. He's always supportive and letting you learn and teach you things that he knows and it's great. We are the customers. We're the guys in the garage. We're building bikes. We like all different types of motorcycles. We like racing. So a lot of times when we're looking at carrying parts or designing parts, we are looking for the solutions we need. Uh, what we would want as a customer, you know, pricing, everything is based off of that. You know, some things we focus on are producing extremely well-designed, thoughtful, high-quality products that are also manufactured efficiently where we can sell them to our customer at a really good price. You know, that's employing local people using U.S. steel or aluminum or what have you and make parts that are just really high quality, great fit. The customer is going to be really happy. They're going to be durable. It's, you know, again, it's, it's a long-term view. It's not looking to sell a bunch of stuff and make a bunch of money this week. The uh, time, the effort, the brain power we put into developing these products. So the hard work is in all of that design work, figuring it out, you know? The end product might look simple, but there's, in many cases, there could be years of work into some of the more complex products to, to get it dialed to the point that it's shipped to the customer they watch our install video or read the install blog post, put that part on on a Saturday afternoon and they're back on the road and it seems so cut and dry, but there's a ton of uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears that goes into that stuff to make it that easy for the end user. We do curation. So, um, you know, I think we built that trust with our customers over the years where if they buy something from us, they know that it's gonna be what we say it is and they're gonna be happy with it. And they also know though, if they do have a problem with some product they purchase, we're still gonna be around in 30 days <laughs> or in three or, years. Something. Or 90 days. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, uh, and you know, we offer free motorcycle tech support on all products, even if it's something we don't sell. I mean, you can call us and we do our best to help out uh, customers, you know, over the phone, via email, you know, solve problems and uh, move forward. Just kind of, uh, instead of doing a bunch of print advertising, I'd rather spend that money on giving customers direct support and fast shipping and all these other things that make their experience better. Something I say frequently to people is, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. What's good for the motorcycle industry and what's good for our customers and motorcycle enthusiasts, it all comes around and it's good for us which is why we put a lot of time and effort into 
for doing free events, free shows, campouts, free swap meets, creating a lot of media we put out for free. You know, I think that has long lasting implications. But the main thing is doing what's right. And uh, honestly, what we believe in and not ever sacrificing our core beliefs for money, because that's, you know, when you get corrupted like that, in my opinion, you know, what's the point? I don't know, you know, to me that's, I don't know, it would ruin everything. Well, I think one thing with all of the employees here is everyone really genuinely cares. Uh, I mean, every package we sell, out of the, we sell and ship out the door, every part we add, every part we design, I mean, we actually care. We're not just adding in a book of miscellaneous junk that everyone else carries. You know, we want your experience from the time you order on our website to that package showing up at your door, a phone call in for tech support or anything, we want it to be just top notch. I hope it stays small like this, because it's awesome. People seem to really appreciate like s small business, like DIY guys type of thing. I don't know. I think it's perfect how it is and I just see it getting better and better. One thing we're very aware of here is just the future. So we're always watching what is going on in the world and the market. Um, we try not to jump on trends. There's enough guys doing that and it's not about a quick buck. We're in this for the long haul. Uh, and what we do isn't for everyone. You know, it's not supposed to appeal to every person who rides a motorcycle. And that's excellent. You know, I don't want to appeal to everyone. So those people, who we resonate with are our, you know, diehard supporters and customers, and they keep us doing what we love. And that's just how I like it.